It is good to be back today. I thank God for His blessings. Thankful for the mercies He's provided, His goodness, His grace. He has been better than any of us in here ever deserved. I hope you realize that tonight. You've not earned a one of God's blessings. I've not either. I'm just thankful tonight that He loved us before we got saved. He loved us after we got saved. And He's loved us with an everlasting love that's never going to end. Open your Bibles tonight, if you will, to Ezekiel chapter 23. Ezekiel chapter 23. I use this passage of Scripture probably 25, 26 years ago. I just felt like God leading me back to it tonight. I just sort of goes along with the message from Sunday morning. And I sure hope God will let me get this one out better than I got that one out Sunday morning. I told somebody it was almost an embarrassment. They told me, said, well, the devil knew somebody needed it until the devil was trying to mess you up. I'm thankful for every blessing he supplied. Thankful for each one of y'all. I appreciate you being here. Yeah. I know it's a cool evening. It's been easy to stay at the house. Oh, some of you has had some rough days today. But you came out anyway. And I thank you for that. I thank you for your faithfulness to God's house. If you're able to stand tonight respecting the Word of God, I'm going to read four verses of Scripture. Ezekiel chapter 23, and we'll start in verse number 1. The Bible's talking about two sisters. And those two sisters are actually Samaria and Jerusalem, or the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. Ezekiel chapter 23, start in verse 1. The word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Son of man, there were two women, the daughters of one mother. They committed whoredoms in Egypt, they committed whoredoms in their youth. There were their breasts pressed, and there they bruised the teats of their virginity. <coughs> and the names of them were Ahola the elder, and Aholaba her sister. And they were mine. And they bare sons and daughters. Thus were their names. Samaria is Ahola, Jerusalem is a whole of all. Thank you. You can be seated. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, as we come to you again, we thank you. We praise you for the day that you've given us and for the way that you took care of us. You've watched over us. You've supplied every need. We thank you, Lord, for the health and strength that you've given us. Thank you for safekeeping from harm and danger, both seen and unseen. We thank you, Lord, tonight for the privilege we have to be back in your house. We thank you for this place that we can come and gather together. We thank you for these people who have come tonight faithful to honor you by their presence here. We thank you that we have this opportunity to worship together and to fellowship one with another. Father, I thank you most of all tonight for salvation. I thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the blood that he shed at Calvary. Thank you, Father, tonight that He did it all. He left nothing out, left nothing undone. God, I beg you to forgive me for I've let you down, for I've failed you, for I've come short. And I ask you, God, just to help me now for the next few minutes. I want to thank you for the service already, for the song that was sung. Father, never get tired of hearing the song, Jesus Loves Me, for the Bible tells me so. I thank you for each one of those testimonies. It's always good to hear people brag on your goodness and your grace and your mercy. But God, I need your help now for the next few minutes. I need you to give me that touch that I need and that fresh anointing from on high. I need you to put your words in my mouth show me what you'd have me to do. I pray, God, tonight that I'll be obedient. I pray, Father, tonight that you'd watch my mouth. Don't let me say 
something wrong. Don't let me say something to lead people astray. But only let me say what you have said to warn your people and to encourage your people. I beg you now go with us through the rest of this service and have your way. For we ask it in a sweet, precious, holy name of Jesus. Amen. When you look at the descendants of Abraham, when you look at the descendants of Isaac and Jacob, God has blessed that family. God has blessed that nation wonderfully well. And you can't brag on what he's done for the Hebrew people enough. <clears throat> he took care of them. He promised Abraham, he said, your seed will be as the stars of the sky and as the sands by the seashore. He kept his promise. They went down into Egypt, was there for 430 years, and he brought them back out. Brought them out with more than they went in with and gave them that land of promise even though they, they disobeyed, they murmured, they complained, they whined, they belly ached. And they wandered around in circles for 40 years. That generation after Joshua died, there rose up a generation that knew not God. They went a-wandering. They became spiritual harlots became spiritual adulterers and adulteresses. God would allow his nation to come in and God would raise up judges and turn back to God. And that went on for a period of about 400 years. Samuel came on the scene and tried to tell the people how to live. After a while, the people said, we want to be like everybody else. Give us a king. God said, Samuel, you grant the request. They have not rejected you. They've rejected me. Right. Mm -hmm. Starting with Saul, and I thank God for David, and I thank God for Solomon. Thank God for kings like Asa, and Josiah, Hezekiah, Joash. They, they, for the majority of the time, they did that which was right in the sight of God. But I ever one of them at some point let down God. Just like you and I do. The northern kingdom after it was split, not one, not one, did that which was right in the sight of God. Now, they've gone into captivity. And a whole lot in the book of Ezekiel explains how they got there. This is what you did. I don't want there to be any doubt about why y'all are in the land of Babylon. And here in chapter 23, he begins to liken Samaria and Jerusalem or Judea with two sisters. Same family. But they both committed whoredoms. They both played the harlot. They both committed spiritual adultery. A whole lot of Samaria, if you go on down, it says that she doted on the Assyrians. And God said, okay, you want the Assyrians? The Assyrians are going to come in and take you over. The Judeans, Jerusalem, they doted on the Babylonians. You read it on down through there. God said, I'll give you the Babylonians. He said, verse 17, and the Babylonians came to her into the bed of love and they defiled her. Well, don't ever doubt Romans chapter number 1 when he says that he'll turn us over to a reprobate mind. He'll give us what we want. If we don't want him, he's not going to force himself on us. Right. And I'm afraid the world we're living in tonight, there's a lot of the body of Christ that is just like a whole lot and a whole lot. We think tonight, well, I can walk away from God or I can do what I want to live and I can live any way I want to live and everything's going to be just fine. No, folks, there's not only spiritual scars, but they can end up being physical scars. Mm -hmm. 
There's a price to be paid for walking away from God. There's a price to be paid for playing the harlot against God. And don't you ever forget the Bible still tells us that we're not our own because we've been bought with a price. Right. So let's just look at this just for a few minutes and think about it. And Brother, Brother Herman mentioned it from Sunday morning. We need to be careful. We think we're standing tall. If we're not careful, some little something, some little something can trip us up <coughs> and make us fall. And as I said, Sunday morning, just like the house built on the shifting sand, great is the fall of it. And you say, preacher, not me. It'll never happen. Well, let me just tell you this. You take a set of steps. And everybody that I've ever known that put in a set of steps, the risers were constant. Yeah. Step was the same width. Riser was the same height. They say if you stop, start, excuse me, start at the bottom of those steps and go up them. If that last step is as much as a sixteenth of an inch off. If it's a sixteenth of an inch shorter than what the rest of the risers have been, 90% of the people are going to stumble at that top step. Yeah. I'm afraid sometimes we just get used to this walk that we're in. And I'm thankful He loves us with an everlasting love. I'm thankful. As the preacher said Sunday night, Thank God I'm saved. Once I'm saved, I'm always saved. Mm -hmm. But there's not a one of us in here that's not subject to stumble. Right. We're not subject to fall. We're not subject... Look, every one of us is going to be tempted of the devil. I don't care who you are. Right. But it's up to us as to how we handle that temptation. We can either fall to it or we can say, get me behind me, Satan. You're the fence to me. We're to be sober. We're to be vigilant. For our adversary, the devil is a roaring lion, walking about, seeking whom he may devour. Well, what are we supposed to do? Rebuke the devil and he'll flee from us. Mm -hmm. But I'm afraid too many times we get to the point We'll say, I can handle it. There's none of us that can handle sin. So, I'm going to give this very simple message tonight. Son of man, there were two women, the daughters of one mother, they committed whoredoms. In Egypt, they committed whoredoms in their youth. The Bible tells us in James chapter 4, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship with the world is enmity of God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world will be an enemy of God. Now he's not talking about we're supposed to hate people we come in contact with. And don't ever forget this. I know that I've mentioned this a lot, especially in the last few months. But when he's talking about the world, he's talking about the characteristics of the world. Yeah. And I ain't going to take the time, but you go back tonight and you read the works of the flesh in Galatians chapter 5. Yeah. And think about the top world we're living in right now. When people get their eyes off of God and get them on the things of the world. Yeah. Get them on the pleasures of this world. And when we begin to look at the things of the world and, and get our eyes off of God, the Bible says that is enmity with God. We are at variance with God. Then We have a difference in us and God. And we're not supposed to have a difference. We're supposed to walk together. Yeah. <coughs> Because how can two walk together except to be agreed, Amos says. Right. 
And he tells us when we begin to put our eyes on the world, then we are spiritual adulterers and adulteresses. And when we, we think about something like this, when people say, well, preacher, I ain't never, I ain't never put my hand on another woman. I ain't never put my ain't even thought about another woman with, with lust in my heart. I'm not a no, huh? Not only tonight am I supposed to stay true to my bride that's sitting by right back there. I'm supposed to be true to the bridegroom mm -hmm. that's sitting at the right hand of the Father. Right. And if I am untrue, if I am unfaithful, if I am cheating on Him, I have become a spiritual adulterer. And there's no, uh, no other way to do it. The Bible tells us in 1 John chapter 2, you're not going to get anything new tonight. The Bible tells us in 1 John chapter 2, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. <coughs> we look, and we say, all this that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. We look at it, and we want it. Preacher, what's wrong with me wanting it? Might not be God's will for you to have it. Mm -hmm. right. And I've had heard people make the statements literally now, I, you know, along with spiritual adultery, you look at physical adultery, and even heard people make the statements, pray that I can marry that woman or marry that man. And I said, are you stupid? They already married. The lust of the eyes. The lust of the flesh. Things that feel good. We might even mention that a little bit. Lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. I ain't totally ignorant. I know what you can get out of a bottle will give you a temporary buzz. But it's just temporary. What you get from God's eternal and everlasting. Amen. What you get from a needle is just temporary. Well, it might be permanent if you overdo it. But what you get from God ain't never going to stop. You said, a preacher, I'm not always on the mount. Neither was Jesus. Right. But thank God, even when we're in the valley, He's not there too. Mm -hmm. But He tells us, He said, don't, don't think about that lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. He said, all this is of the world and the world passes away. But he that do the will of my Father abides forever. When First John, or when John was writing that first letter, he was writing it to God's people. I firmly am convinced of that. I know that the majority of that was written to God's people. Giving us assurance of our salvation. Letting us know that if when we when we fail him. I know the first part of it was written to lost people, but a whole lot of that letter was written to God's people. And we need to understand tonight. There is a sin unto death. You say that's got nothing to do with this. Really? What did they do with adulterers and adulteresses in biblical time? Mm -hmm. They stoned them. Right. If I was cheating on my wife, she wouldn't divorce me. That's right. No. They'd take me outside the city walls and stone me to death. That's And I don't know what it might be in my case. I don't know what it might be in your case. But 
at some point, if we continually live in a way that we're spiritual adulterers and adulteresses, one of these days we'll cross that line and God's going to say, enough. Yeah. You say, but preacher, what about all these people that have lived outside the will of God and they live like dogs for years and God ain't never bothered them and God ain't never doing anything to them and they seem like everything's going on and they don't belong to Him. That's right. Yeah. Had people say, well, you know, preacher, I've been backslid for about 25 years. No, you ain't. You never did slide up. That's right. It's hard for me to believe. Now, I don't know the mind of God. It's hard for me to believe God's going to allow somebody to stay out of His will that long. Mm -hmm. And no chastening. Right. You're not His if you ain't got the chastisement. We look and you can't even... Imagine the subject we're talking about without Revelation chapter 2 and that first church at Ephesus. Now remember in chapter 1 we see Jesus in the center and all the churches revolving around Him which is how it ought to be. Right. This church, He ought to be in the center of it and everything we do ought to revolve around Him. Mm -hmm. He should be in the center of my life Amen. and what I do ought to revolve around Him. And yet, in the first generation, after Jesus had ascended back to the Father, John's on the Isle of Patmos. Jesus comes to him. John writes these letters to the seven churches which were in Asia. And he starts out with the church at Ephesus. The one that Paul warned him. He said, I know that after my departure, and I think we just read it last Sunday, might have been last Wednesday night, but he said, I know that after my departure, rabbit and wolves will come in. Some of your own selves will deny the faith. And he tells it. He said, I know your works, and I know your labor, and I know your faith. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because you've left your first love. Yeah, right. The main thing's not the main thing anymore. And the church is no longer acting like a church. Church is acting more like a social club. Yeah. And don't get me wrong, folks. I, it, it thrills my soul when we'll have visitors come in here. The fellow that was with, with Brother Doug, that Brother Doug invited Sunday. Tell me again his name. Jerry, sat right there. After he left, he said, everybody was just so friendly. Everybody was so nice. Everybody was just so welcoming. And I got to tell you, that thrills my soul. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That it does. Yeah. That's how we ought to be. Yeah. To everybody that comes in. Mm -hmm. But this is not a place for lost people to sit here and feel comfortable. Right. Yeah. Instead of comfort, it ought to be conviction. Right. And if all we're worried about is keeping them comfortable, and let's just love them to death. No, you, can't, you can love them to hell is what you'll do. Yeah. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. But if all we're concerned about is their comfort and their peace of mind, we've left our first love. Yeah. And as a church, we're committing spiritual adultery. So what does he tell them to do? Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen <coughs> and repent and do the first works. Mm -hmm. What's the first work? Preach the gospel. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Have standards. Have convictions. Pray for lost people. Be concerned about their soul salvation. It's a wonderful thing for us to have love and fellowship one with another. It is. This is not a trick statement. 
We have to love each other. If we don't love each other, we're, we're going contrary to what the Word of God says. That was one of the things Brother Mike said Sunday night. One of, the, one of the signs of knowing that we're saved is that companionship. We know that we pass from death unto life because we love the brethren. Jesus said, men will know that you're my disciples if you have love one for another. But loving somebody and condoning sin is two separate things. When we quit taking a stand against sin, we have left our first love. Mm -hmm. So how are you and I supposed to walk? We're saved by the grace of God. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things are made new again. We are walking not by the flesh, according to Romans chapter 8. We shouldn't be walking by the flesh, but we should be walking after the leadership of the Spirit. Romans chapter 6 tells us then because of that sin shall no longer have dominion over you. Mm -hmm. So we should walk in newness of life. We are not the same. Things that are different. I think that was Brother Curtis Hudson preached a message with that title years ago. Things that are different are not the same. Right. Now, I'm going to take it out of context from what he tried to preach it. Once we are saved, we should be different because we're not the same. Right. Yeah. He was talking about churches with different doctrine, right. different beliefs. But if you're saved by the grace of God, you are no longer the same. So you ought to be different in the way that you walk. Mm -hmm. I don't have any business getting saved on Sunday and by the next Saturday night being back in the bar drunk somewhere. There's yeah. something wrong. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now what he's telling us when he says sin no longer has dominion over us, that says sin no longer controls us. We ought to be have control over ourselves. Paul said, I crucify this flesh daily. He said, I keep this body under subjection. He said, it's not sin that's going to control me now. I'm going to control this with the help of the Lord. Mm -hmm. I may have been an alcoholic, but this body screaming for another shot of liquor, it ain't going to get that shot of liquor because with the help of the Lord, I'm going to keep this body under subjection. That's right, that's right. And I'm going to mortify the members of this body. I'm going to die out to what, that, what this body wants. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to live the way I used to live. I'll wind down here in a minute. <clears throat> you and I don't need to be a whole on a whole of We are children of the living God. Amen. We are a part of the bride of Christ. Paul said, I have espoused you to one room. We are to be true. We are to be faithful. We should not be guilty of infidelity when it comes to our walk with Christ. Right. Amen. I've gone from home this weekend for two or three days. Now I understand I was with Roger. <clears throat> but even if I had been by myself, my wife should have had the... Uh, no, let me rephrase that. I should never have given my wife a reason to ever have any doubt in me while I was gone. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> I'm not in church seven days a week. Which means, even when I'm not out of church, when I'm not in church, when you're not in church, when we're not around each other, we should still walk soberly and righteously right. in this present world. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. 
So, let me wind down. Philippians chapter 1. Bible says, And this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. See, if we will grow in the grace and the knowledge and the admonition of the Lord, then our love is going to grow for the Lord. Folks, listen to me. If you've been saved any length of time at all, your love for God today ought to be greater than it was when you got saved. Amen. Because you ought to be knowing as you go through this life, it ought to be coming more and more and more and more and more apparent to you just how much God did love you. And the more you learn about it, He still loves me. And when I think about what I used to be, how could He love me? But He did. And we love Him because He first loved us. Now, God can never, and I agree with a statement Brother Mike made Sunday night. I don't think God can ever love us any more than He ever has. Because God doesn't change. Yeah. God loved me enough to save me. God loved me enough to send Jesus to die for me. God still loves me tonight with that same love. I don't think He could have loved us any more than He did even before we got saved. But yet, the longer you and I are saved, the more we ought to love Him. And the more we love somebody, the less likely we are to do something to hurt them. The less likely we are to do something derogatory towards them or do something detrimental toward them or the less likely we are to commit physical or spiritual or emotional adultery on them. So he says, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and all judgment and that you may approve things that are excellent that you may be sincere and without offense until the day of Christ. Used to be a song, Oh, how I love Jesus because He first loved me. But we ought to be able to sing that song and sing it without a, with, from a pure heart. Sing it sincerely. I love Jesus. Yeah. And nobody, people, people all look at us and not doubt that at all. Because they see the way we live. Mm -hmm. Now, if they're seeing something in us that shouldn't be there, and we say, I love Jesus, then sure you do. <coughs> sure you do. We look at the nation of Israel. And we look at the things just, just back through the book of Ezekiel. And they're saying, Ezekiel, I don't understand. How did we get here? Ezekiel says, I'm going to tell you. He told them in, that in chapter 13, God said, all you got around you is lying prophets. He said, what do you mean lying prophets? False prophets today. Preachers that ain't preaching the truth. Preachers that ain't preaching the gospel. Preachers that are preaching and anything goes kind of thing. Yep. Chapter 22, he tells them you're nothing but dross meant for the furnace. And I know we've looked at that before, and when you look at your refining metal, dross is the impurities that float to the top. Mm -hmm. God said it does not matter how much I run you through the fire or run you through the furnace, you're still nothing but dross. And you know what happens to dross? It gets scraped off the top and thrown into a can. Yeah. They refuse to get their heart right with God. They refuse to get their sins under the blood. They refuse to walk in a way that God would have them to walk. He even tells them in chapter 28 how Satan's going to be destroyed and how he's going to be defeated. And Ezekiel reminds them in chapter 33, Look, the watchman's been on the wall. The watchman's been on the wall. The watchman warned you. The watchman blew the trumpet. The watchman sounded the alarm. And yet, you still wouldn't listen. And that's the world we're living in tonight. Mm -hmm. 
and people who have professed Christ and never been saved, some people say, I don't need Him at all. The word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Son of men, there were two women, the daughters of one mother, and they committed whoredoms in Egypt. They committed whoredoms in their youth. I told you a few minutes ago, <coughs> you look at the works of the flesh in Galatians chapter 5, and you're going to see how professing Christians today commit adultery on God. But in 2 Peter or 2 Timothy chapter 3, he says, In the last days perilous time shall come. And you can look down that list and you can see there's no love one for another. But folks, I'm going to tell you something. Jesus himself said that when you knock down their commandments and you knock them down just to two, one says, Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. The second so I can do it, <coughs> love thy neighbor as thyself. All right. I was talking to a woman at the funeral home today and made the statement to her then. I said, how in the world can I claim to know Jesus when the Bible says, how can I love God whom I have not seen if I can't love my brother who I have said. Yeah, that's right. No love one for another. Covetous. Pride. And, and coveted. That's that lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride. Just about narrow, take it all down to just that. Why do people steal to get something somebody else has got? Yep. Why do people kill Trump to take something that they ain't got? Covetous, boasters, proud, unthankful, unholy, false accusers, lovers of pleasure, more than lovers of God. I told you a while ago, and I've said it many times down through the years, that Wednesday night crowds the backbone of the church. Usually, you've got a Sunday morning crowd. And I can just about tell you who ain't coming back on Sunday night. And I can just about tell you who ain't going to be here on Wednesday night. Don't get me wrong. They ain't talking about people that's working. They ain't talking about people that's sick. I'm talking about people that will just tell you. There was somebody coming into the funeral home on a, at a visitation sometime back on a Wednesday night. And Terry looked at him. They said... Brother Wayne's going to wonder where you at tonight. And they looked at him, had no problem with what come out of their mouth. And I said, oh, I don't go to church on Wednesday night. He said, oh, okay. Maybe it ain't important to some people. I need it. Whether anybody else knows it or not. I know things have come up sometimes and you, you can't. It's, I understand that. Just make sure that the ox is actually fell in the ditch and you didn't push him in there. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay? I told you. Go somewhere on vacation. I'll find you a church. I'll find you a church. Heard about two good ones this past weekend. Any of you ever goes around close to New Orleans? I can tell you about a good one close to there. One of you ever goes down to, to, to Mouse World, I can tell you about a good one down close to that. Met two fine, pre fine young preachers this past weekend from right. London. God's got His people. Yes. Yeah. We just need to make our mind up that we're going to join in together and we're not going to cheat on God. Yes. Yeah. That we're not going to be adulterers and adulteresses, that we're not going to be a hole in a hole of all, that we are going to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world for the rest of the world that's living in the old way they want to. Folks, tonight, I know it's pretty simple, but let me tell you something. The same way 
that I would never want my wife to cheat on me. God doesn't want me and you cheating on him. Mm -hmm. I got a Savior tonight sitting at the throne. And thank God one of these days he's coming back after me. Yeah. I, I don't want anything between me and him. Mm -hmm. We slip. Yes, we do. We need to fess up. But can I tell you something? Nobody, hear me what I'm about to say. No married man, no married woman has ever had an accidental affair. Right. Mm -hmm. Isn't that? Ain't no such thing. Folks, let me tell you something. There might be a word slip. There might be a thought pop in our head. We might even, before we've even thought about it, words come flying out of our mouth that we wish to God we could grab them and bring them right back in. But to sit and plan on something that's ungodly. Yeah. To plan on doing something that's wrong and we know it's wrong. We're no different than a whole lot of whole lot. And we're committing spiritual adultery in God. Father, we thank you for the day. Thank you for taking care of us, for watching over us. Thank you for allowing us to be back in your house tonight. Thank you for each one of these that's come out. I thank you, Lord, that you give us an opportunity to look at a portion of your word. And I pray, God, tonight I said what you'd have me to say. Pray that I've said it in the right way. <coughs> God, I pray that you take the message and use it. Lord, help us to live the way you'd have us to live. God, don't let us be a whole and a whole of all, but let us, God, be faithful. Let us be true to the one that we've been a spouse to. Go with us now through the rest of this service and have your way. For what you do, we'll thank you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.